Migration Conversations is a podcast that invites persons to share their migration stories. Hosted by myself, Professor Jamie Liu, each episode is an in-depth conversation with people who have experienced the Canadian immigration system or other migration regimes up close. We talk to migrants, immigrants, lawyers, policymakers, advocates, and experts. We hope that these conversations shed light on the challenges migrants face through their own voices. Welcome to a two-part episode of Migration Conversations, where we talk to former migrant caregivers. In our two-part conversation, we talk to members of Migrante Ottawa, a cause-oriented organization that promotes the rights and welfare of Filipino migrants in Canada. The nonprofit volunteer-based organization is part of Migrante Canada, which is a national alliance of migrant advocacy organizations. Migrante Ottawa supports Filipino migrant workers and seeks to address the political, social, and economic conditions that lead to the abuse and exploitation of migrant workers. In part one, we will hear about Mary Jane's experience as a temporary foreign worker in an embassy and as a caregiver. In part two, we talk with Melanie about her experience as a caregiver of children and with a person with high medical needs. In part two, we also speak with Emma, an advocate with Migrante Ottawa. As you listen to Mary Jane and Melanie's stories, think about how immigration law and the design of the temporary foreign worker program shaped their lived experiences in Canada. I want to let listeners know that what you may be hearing may be upsetting or disturbing and to pause and take a break from this podcast if you need it. Uh, For those of you who took a break, welcome back. Um, I want to thank Mary Jane again for sharing her story um, and for uh, having the courage to um, express herself so openly and honestly. Uh, We're going to talk to Melanie now, who is also a former caregiver here in Canada. And I wanted to start from the beginning of your story, um, as I did with Mary Jane, can you tell me why you decided to come to Canada and how you were able to do so? Hi, I'm Melanie. I decided to come to Canada. Aside from Canada is my dream country. I wanted to give my kids a good life because back home, my salary was not good enough to support their needs. Um, And so when you first came to Canada, I understand that you first came to Vancouver and worked as a live-in caregiver with a family. Um, Can you tell me what your job entailed and what it was like to work for that family? Um, I came here in Canada June 2014 uh, to work as a live-in caregiver in a Canadian family, a Scottish-Mexican family. Uh, to take care of two kids. Uh, My working uh, permit only allowed me to work in one employer, uh, like a specific employer. They're like very loud, always yelling every day, even you're still asleep. They keep like, yeah, they, I don't know. They're loud family and, but kids are, but kids were nice to me because I will like, I am nice to the kids too. So one day my employer lost her job and become depressed and aggressive. And then after the swimming, uh, one of her uh, daughter's swimsuit, I put it in the washing machine and she didn't like it. And then uh, uh, she came to the basement to take out the swimsuit in the washing machine and then slammed the door. And then after slamming the door, she broke it and she blamed it on me. It's like I was scared because she yelled on my face and grabbed my arms. And it's like I was like panicking. All I did was to like run away, go to the washroom and stay there for an hour. till I cooled down. 
So that was my experience in my first employer. I'm sorry to hear that. That sounds very disturbing, Melanie. Um, and it sounds like the family uh, was very loud and aggressive and violent as well. Um, did you ever talk to anybody about this situation? Did you ever confront your employer about her treatment of you? Like I, I was scared. I just keep quiet and like I have no friends to talk to that time. So uh, then one day I met a friends and I, I have the courage to talk about my situation. And then she just advised me to report it in the immigration. And it's like, I thought about it overnight. And then I just decided to hand them my resignation and leave after two weeks notice. So after two weeks, I leave them. So how long were you working with that family before you uh, left? I worked with them for nine months. So you endured this yeah. kind of treatment for nine months? Yeah, it was Christmas when that happened. So it's like, I'm alone for Christmas, like thinking if I'm gonna leave the family before Christmas or after Christmas, but I really need to find another employer. So it took me like three months to decide. Yeah, that sounds like a very difficult decision. Um, uh, you eventually left. Um, can you tell me how um, that was possible and whether you received any support or help in leaving that situation uh, when i left uh, i always stayed in the i always go to the church and meet some friends like i open myself to the possibility of meeting some friends who can help me find a new employer and then there's one friend a friend of my friend who is looking for a replacement to like to take care of an elderly but if i'm willing to leave to move in uh, ontario uh, she gonna talk to her uh, employer to hire me and yeah the next week um, I already have a plane ticket because I'm planning to move to London because I have like friends in London and then from London uh, one of uh, grandma's um, daughter-in-law picked me up there and the next day i signed a contract and started they started to train me so your second job uh, you were able to find because you had attended church and met a friend there and they had heard about an employment opportunity in ontario and you moved from vancouver to ontario to work as a living caregiver but this time for an elderly person um, can you tell me about the working conditions and the, the, what you did in that new employment? Um, I signed a contract. Uh, in the contract, it, uh, we signed that we agree that I'm going to work 44 hours a day, uh, 44 hours a week, and they're going to pay me 15 hours a day. But what happened is I worked 25, uh, 24 hours for five days because it was only me and Oma at home. And after two weeks, uh, they sent me to a driving school because no one will take care of Oma. So, but driving is not really in the contract. So if I understand it correctly, you were contracted to work 40 hours a week? 44 hours. 44 hours a week for $15 an hour. Um, but what you ended up doing was working 24 hours a day because she needed Four care. Days. She needed care um, at night as well. Yes. And uh, that essentially you worked around the clock. Can you tell me what kind of care she needed and what your job entailed? She'd she been like a stroke for five years when I started working with her. And she was like, I'm giving her a bath. It's like I've been awake the whole night because uh, there are nights that she can't, she couldn't sleep. And she's like, she's always scared that nobody is there for her every time she needs help. So it's, 
like because it's it was only me at home so every time as uh, she called me i always uh go and run to her because i don't want something happen to her when i'm at work that must have been extremely exhausting and stressful you go from one stressful situation where you are working with a depressed uh, employer who aggressively is taking her stress out on you to an extreme situation where you're working 24 hours a day to care for someone with high needs. Um, how did you cope with that situation? Yeah, it was very hard at first. It's, it's like, I really need that job to get my permanent residency. It's like there are nights that I don't have a good sleep, but I need to drive her to her doctor's appointment. And I always like talk to them about my situation that I really need help, but I, cause I couldn't take care of her 24 seven. And so you talked to her, was it her children about the situation that you yeah. needed help and did yeah. they, did they understand and did they try to find a solution for this? Yeah, they um, like they told me that they all the children they need to talk about the situation and then they asked help from the government and the government gave them like 12 hours uh, in home caregiver. But sometimes they didn't show up, but because I don't have like car to drive around, I cannot borrow. Uh, my employer's car because uh, sometimes when I'm at home and a government help didn't came and didn't show up, I need to take care uh, for grandma for free. So I don't have any choice. It's like it, during my break time, it's like it's not really my break time because I need to work for free. Yeah, and I think your situation is interesting because you were working in a rural setting. You were not in a city and you were in quite, yeah, you were isolated from other people, other services. Um, how did that affect your mental health living and working um, far away from, you know, other support? that you might have access in a city. Um, it's, it's very exhausting. It's like, I'm always stressed. Like I always, uh, even I always talk to my mom on the phone and to my kids. It's like, it's hard for me because I don't have like someone to talk about it. Because I have friends in, uh, when I talk to my employer about, uh, because I want to spend my time, my day off in Ottawa so that I can like uh, get more sleep and more rest because uh, 24, 24 hours working in five days is really very exhausted and sometimes it, it drives me crazy. Sometimes I got sick, but I don't have like, I don't have time to rest, so I really need to work um, when I'm sick. So did you know that this was not permitted, the long hours, the not getting paid for the work that you were doing? Um, it sounds incredibly challenging to manage. And I'm wondering if you can tell me, um, whether you had any support or or if you knew you could go somewhere to talk or how you dealt with this challenge yeah i i was aware that it was in the contract that wasn't in the contract and it was not permitted in canada i talked to the family about it many times and they just give me like uh okay you can send me a group message every time you want to go to uh, Ottawa to spend your day off with your friends, but that group message uh, will ask them if who gonna drive me to the train station because it took me 30 minutes drive to the train station. And then after two days off, uh, I'm gonna send them again another messages who will uh, uh, pick me up to 
to start my work the next day. So it, it's like, it was hard because I was home, they asked me to look after grandma every time because the play, plane ticket, uh, the, the train ticket is too ex expensive for me. It's like $22 one way. So I paid like if I'm going to spend my days off in Ottawa, I need to pay $50 per week back and forth. So sometimes I stayed at Oma. Oma is like grandma in, uh, in Dutch. So like she's very happy I'm around, but I like I'm not happy because it's supposed to be my off, but my, I, I don't spend it with my friends and it's like I need to be up for 20, sometimes I work 24 seven. Yeah, you, tell, you told me previously that when you were able to get away from uh, the house that when you did go to a friend's house that on your days off you uh, just slept the entire time and that it would only be on the days that the family could relieve you and you didn't always get a regular day off but when you did get a day off you just spent the time sleeping yeah yeah i i always spent my my day of sleeping you eventually um leave that employment can you tell me what led to your leaving and moving to ottawa um i was back home uh when my employer passed away i leave uh i came back in ottawa during uh, like on her funeral day so it was like uh, i received a message when i was in the philippines that my employer passed away so it it was like i was crying when i was in the philippines because i got to attach with my with grandma because i worked for her for three for three years even though i the family didn't uh, treat me that well and didn't pay uh, enough. So it's like it, it breaks my heart too. So, so you when, worked with that family for three years for, yeah, for, three for years. very long hours. And yeah. um, the only reason why you're not working there is because the person you were caring for passed away. So yeah. that was the yeah. Only way you were able to escape this employment was. Yeah. But uh, before, like uh, after two years of working with them, I applied for my permanent residency. And then uh, uh, they let me visit my family after two years back home. And then uh, after my, my vacation, uh, I got my open permit. And then I talked to them about it like if you're not going to follow the what's in the contract i'm gonna move to the city to find another employer and then after I, after that i gave them like two weeks notice that i'm i'm gonna leave after two weeks and then three days before my notice uh, like ending uh, they talked to me that uh, because grandma loves me so much so they're gonna keep me and they're gonna start following the contract but that's the moment when oh when grandma passed away that is super interesting that you say that when you started to have the ability yeah. to negotiate yeah. your conditions because you had an open work permit yeah. that you were able to persuade the employer to follow the rules with regards to employment standards that is super yeah. interesting i think that's an interesting I got the courage finally <laughs> well not only really that because i wasn't like i can change employer and then that's right you had the power to change employers yeah. and i think that's what led to them realizing they had to follow the rules so that's yeah. something to consider that's super interesting um like mary jane you also left a uh, family behind in the philippines can you tell me yeah. who your family like how many children you had and how old they were when you left and how long you were separated from them i was uh, i've been away for eight years i worked in hong kong for three years before i decided to apply as living caregiver in canada i left them when they were 
uh, four years old. My daughter was four years old and my uh, son was just two. It's like uh, they always, every time they, uh, I remember the first time my kids, uh, like during my flight, they just like crying the whole time because they don't want to see me leave. And my mom is like, it's okay, we can take care. The grandparents like, oh, we can take care of them. I know you're gonna work in Hong Kong because you want them to give a good life. And then, yeah, like uh, when I was in Hong Kong, I my employer just gave me two weeks, two weeks uh, to visit my family. It's like, it, it's not good enough for me. And uh, after, after three years, I, I will go to Canada directly. And it's like I've been separated for uh, four years before I, I saw them again. So it's, it's really very hard. And it's like I never witnessed them growing during like Christmas, New Year, their birthday. And then they, they have family um, celebration at the school. We, we always talk in uh, in the phone. Uh, like now we have uh, like like uh, video come, like we can talk to them through like internet. So, but like every time I phone them, they always uh, asking me, when are you gonna come home to see us? It's, it's really hard for me and it's really like break my heart seeing them that it's like ma you missed my graduation ma it's my it, it's my birthday when are you coming home it's like we really missed you it's it's very hard oh melanie i'm so sorry yeah. that sounds really really hard yeah, and I can only imagine what it must feel like when you can't be there yeah. and you don't know when you're going to see them again. Yeah. You said you left them when they were four and two. How yeah. old were they when they were able to come to Canada? Uh, they were like 11 and, uh, 14, 11 and 14. Oh yeah. my, so that was... It was so eight years. It was eight, eight years. years. That's a yes, long like, time. Yeah. Uh, our first six months are, who are you? Because we don't know each other. They were like four and two years old. It's like they only see me in, in the camera, in the video and in the pictures. Because uh, I tried to help my mom to open Facebook so they can like be updated of what's going on in my life in Canada. So it's like, oh, this is this is your mama, but my kids are like, okay. It's like they doesn't care because they're just kids. They're yeah. like young. Yeah. Of course. And then, yeah. Um, they're been here for two years, and it took me six six months to introduce myself. Like every day, I explain to them. Uh, why I need to work abroad and uh, why I need to be like work because I'm um, I am a divorce like I got divorced also I'm a single mom so it's really hard for me I I need to work hard for them because nobody will yeah, but I was so lucky because um, I have my my parents to look after to them while I'm away. Yeah, that sounds like such a long time to be away from your family. Um, I mean, what would you like the government to know um, so that perhaps other people don't have to suffer the way you did on this long family separation and. What you had to endure uh, for me like uh, students and newcomers like they 
they need to have an open permit the very first day they landed in Canada. So whenever they have, whenever they are in abusive employer, they have the right to change employer. I think that says a lot because that affected how your employer treated you, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything else you would like to add or? Um, I'm, I'm so lucky because uh, I have a friend here in Canada and, they, and she introduced me to MJ and then mm -hmm. MJ introduced me to my grande Canada. And then uh, since then, uh, I always spend my day with my grande Ottawa and I started like attending how labor laws work, uh, immigration processing, and they never failed to explain to me wholeheartedly that whatever happened, you you are always have our back. And then they really did something great to me. Like I'm having a hard time disciplining my kids too because no, they are not kids anymore. They're teens. It's like they they are like I I always ask them it's like, am I doing the right thing? of disciplining my kids, it's like, uh, you, you'll, like, it will take time. It will take time. And now we are like brother and sister. <laughs> yeah, I'm so happy and I'm so thankful to my Garante Ottawa for doing a good job in my Canada life. They are, they are my second family here. That sounds amazing. Yeah, it sounds like um, McGrante not only is an amazing advocacy organization, but they provide immense support for people like yourselves. Um, it's a huge testament to the volunteer work that build, is built um, in that organization. Um, I wanna thank you, Melanie, for courageously sharing your story with thank us. Um, I cannot imagine um, how difficult it must be to talk about it and to share your emotions. Um, but it's so heartwarming to see how positive you are now. And I just marveled at how you even just said, I feel so lucky. And it's amazing that you can feel that way after everything you've experienced. Um, so I just want to thank you for sharing your story and for helping to educate potentially future lawyers, policymakers, um, uh, government officials and perhaps current ones that maybe they can take into account your experience when they're designing um, the migrant worker program. So um, listeners of this podcast, uh, this is also another good time to take a break, to pause, you know, absorb the stories of Mary Jane and Melanie. And when you return, I'll shift and talk about the current programs and policy recommendations with our, with our next guest, Amy Baboso. Welcome back to those who took a break. I'm joined here with Emmy Baboso, Advocate for Migrant Workers in Canada. Thank you for taking the time to talk today. Emmy, um, I wanted to start by 
reflecting upon the stories of Mary Jane and Melanie, who you both know very well. And both women speak glowingly about Magrante. They sought assistance and support from Magrante. And I wonder if you could tell us more about Magrante, but also more specifically about Magrante Ottawa. So our work, um, you mentioned earlier that uh, I'm the chairperson of Philippine Migrant Society of Canada. So um, Philippine Migrant Society of Canada was created about 20, more than 20 years ago. And then um, in Canada, it's one of the youngest um, members of Migrante International. So um, when we created, when we finally launched Migrante Canada, we rebranded. So now it's where Migrante Ottawa is part of, you know, just so that people are familiar that every time they come to a city in Canada, there is, we're hoping that we'll cover all provinces, but um, there is a Migrante that they can reach out to that's close to them. Um, what um, what Mayor, Mayor Jane and Melanie has, has shared is, um, is a testament of why, um, why I continue to, to uh, do the work that I do with uh, when I started, uh, when I came here to Ottawa and started getting involved around 2000 as well uh, with Migrantes work. Um, because of the stories that they share. And I didn't want to necessarily dilute by saying that it's the same story after another about a uh, live-in caregiver and the separation with family and also the strangeness that they experience both from the children's side and from the parents' side of, about like when they're separated. But that is in, in our, if, as an advocate, that's what we would say about like, you know, the consequences of my of forced migration, um, which is unfortunate, and you know, um, I hope that the listeners of these podcasts really do consider the policies that they create because they affect not just individual but communities and families. Thank you, Amy. Um, Migrante and its members are doing incredible work, um, you know, all, all across the country, and I continually hear about not only the support that you give, but the advocacy work that you're doing. Um, I wondered if you could comment on Mary Jane's story and specifically on her experience working as a member of a consulate or an embassy and how it's actually not that unique. Can you tell me why it is that staff of embassies or consulates are vulnerable or at risk of abuse or exploitation? So my understanding is that um, uh, members of the diplomatic community, um, uh, ambassadors or their ministers and such, they're allowed to bring to Canada their own private staff that they can hire someone, like whether they be nannies or somebody that works in their household. So I understand that from my few interactions with the Office of Protocol with the, with the Department of Global Affairs Canada. So, so they're allowed to do that. But just kind of like um, any temporary foreign worker, um, like the living caregivers or caregivers now, because they are they work and live inside their employer's home, so automatically um, they are vulnerable to abuse. Because in a household, was it was it Pierre Trudeau that said we have no business in the bedrooms of Canadians? So in that sense, um, there's a hesitancy on the part of the government to intervene. And what happens with with workers but the thing is there is a responsibility because for example for caregivers the federal government created this program to facilitate the coming in of these individuals to work here because there is a shortage of uh, workers that would provide care for Canadian families um, uh, and also have that um, service and labor affordable to Canadian families. So they have to um, resource it from outside. Um, same thing with the diplomatic community. Um, they have made an agreement between country to country, a bilateral agreement that yes, we will set up shop, make office, have office in the country. But of course you have to follow certain protocols. So in a sense, um, you there are, uh, we we are in a position that like you you have to ha you have to intervene when there is 
abuse. And the Office of the Protocol has told us that workers in the embassy are entitled to minimum standards of work. But again, who will enforce that when they are working in that home? And like Mary Jean was saying, it's heavily guarded usually. Um, it's gated. So how would we know if their employers are actually following the rules unless they report? But we know also that because in an employer-employee relationship, there's an automatic imbalance, especially if you have temporary status. So when you have temporary status, regardless of how much you know about your rights, um, more than likely you would not assert those rights because you live in that in the place where you work as well. And you you don't know, especially with Mary Jane, she's never been to Canada before and ended up here and cannot go out even though she has family, but she's heavily guarded so and monitored. So how do you assert your rights then? Yeah, it is a very fraught situation. And I thank you, MA. I think we both agree that the more attention, more attention should be paid to those with temporary and precarious status in Canada, and especially those that are employed by other states, and that the excuse of diplomatic protection or foreign relations should not shield the basic obligation in Canada to ensure workers' rights are protected. Um, and one way Canada can do this is providing pathways for obtaining temporary permits for persons who attest to abuse or exploitation in these working environments, similar to what's provided to women sponsored by their abusive spouses in Canada. I think, as you mentioned, however, the issue and the problem is how do we find out or how do we monitor and enforce um, the rules that regulate our employment situations in Canada in situations where these workers are hidden from view or are guarded or prevented from engaging in any outside interaction. So that is going to be, I think, a problem that we will continue to see um, going forward. Um, I may, uh, Mary Jane and Melanie both worked as caregivers um, of children and elderly persons. Mary Jane was able to find a family and an employer that provided a good working environment. Melanie, however, was not so lucky with two experiences, um, one dealing with family with children, the other with an elderly person. Can you comment on why the caregiver program historically has provided opportunities for employers to exploit and abuse caregivers? Well, again, I already, I think I've mentioned this, that um, the, well, no, I didn't. The, the program is employer centric. So, um, and you see that also in the treatment uh, of, uh, of the employers and, um, and employees. So we've seen, we've seen news when, you know, uh, employers were abusive and such, and then there's a news coverage, but really most of them, unless like it was, um, uh, like a widespread trafficking, they get like um, a slap in the hand, or, you know, and they get away with it. And then they would have, we had experience before we're in, you know, um, Mary Jane mentioned um, the keeping of a passport. So um, that has happened to one of the individuals that came to ask for help from us. But then she was, um, the, she was punished because she said that like, the the CBSA officers told her that like well didn't you know that you it it's illegal for them to take your passport so you should have kept your passport and insisted but how do you insist when you live at their house and they said that we will take away your passport because we don't because we're afraid you'd run away from us and and then when she finally called the police because she couldn't take the abuse anymore the police came the police said oh it's an immigration matter so it's not our jurisdiction and CBSA came and then they took the worker away and she was the one who was put in an isolation and nothing came out of the work of the employers and she was the one who was asked to report to CBSA every week and also that basically she was said that you violated uh, uh, immigration uh, con committed an immigration infraction because you didn't you wa walk walked around without your papers yeah, it is astonishing to see how even when 
workers have the courage to seek help or to report abuse or exploitation that sometimes it's turned against them. Um, thank you, MA. Now, the caregiver program has undergone immense change um, in recent years. We've seen a more use of using the open work permit system, which Melanie mentioned. Also, the elimination of the live-in requirement, which as you spoke and as Mary Jane talked about and Melanie, um, that that creates environments and opportunities for abuse. And the launch of two pilot programs geared one to caregivers for children and caregivers for high medical needs. But since the pilots have expired, Canada currently does not have a caregiver program at the moment. As of June 2019, new applications will not be processed. What does this tell you about the government's approach to this program currently or this the fact that there is no program? Do you anticipate a new caregiver program being developed and launched? What are your concerns given that there is no new pathway for ca caregivers to migrate to Canada? First, I don't like the word pathway because pathway is so abstract and um, not clear actually, even though it's it's a pathway on, in dictionary terms and the way it sounds is very positive, but really for the experiences of temporary workers in general, including caregivers, it's like, what kind of pathway? Is it like this kind of pathway where it's up and down or is it a zigzag pathway? Is there hoops in the pathway? Is there, you know, boulders to climb and then you get to the other side of the pathway? So that's just as an aside. Um, uh, in terms of, for Migrantes position, we've always called for status at the outset. Status now at the outset because with status, it mitigates vulnerable, vulnerability to abuse. So we've always called for that. So now that there's no program, it is quite, it, it's a reflection of, um how disposable these late these workers are because oh so you, uh, how disposable these workers are so they just stop you know it's policy right so um it's not that they don't need it because we don't have universal child care system or elderly care system so we're just going to stop the coming in of workers but but it's said there that you can if you want to work in Quebec so, but at the same time, there are, there's still the temporary foreign worker program. So perhaps you could still come in, but um, as a, I don't know, a babysitter, but then again, like temporary, like you have no pathway to citizenship. So, but no one's really tested it because there's not a lot of processing going on right now because of COVID. So we don't really know, but if they, if, um, but we, what we know, what the facts that we know is that the Canadian population is aging. We still, we don't have a universal child care system or a, uh, um, an elderly care system. With COVID, there are now small, um, smaller sizes of availability of spaces for caregivers, for, for daycare. So who knows? And then hopefully, I don't know if we'll be consulted because last time, the last time that um, the last time that uh, the pilot programs were um, were created, we had to ask them to consult us. When usually you're in a government situation, you're supposed to reach out to stakeholders, and they know of us. And we were we are in Canada. Uh, I'm sorry, we are in Ottawa. So really, in terms of like you know, for government not to spend money to transport someone to consult, like we're already here. And it's not that they don't know we existed because we've, you know, we've had publications, they've consulted us before and stuff. So I don't know if that was a miss on their, on whoever's in charge of that program, but there was a lack of efforts to consult those that are actually working directly with the with workers that are in this program. Yeah, or it's really, it's, it's actually quite interesting because there is a demand for caregivers. And I imagine, you know, during the pandemic, it's been very interesting to see the demand for caregivers and also to see the hero, the, 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 the use of the word heroism uh, aligned with caregivers. But we see this associated more with non-racialized uh, caregivers, right? And I think it's interesting to see how 
the discourse around racialized caregivers, especially Filipino caregivers in long-term care facilities um, has been very problematic in Canada, um, mm -hmm. particularly they're being blamed for uh, the spread of the coronavirus. Yeah. So um, it will be, I think, interesting to see how policymakers respond to not only the demand of the need for more caregivers, but in terms of understanding now that they are essential workers and doing very difficult jobs, how the program will um, respect them as individuals. Um, just like any um, person coming through the economic class, we see a distinction between high skilled workers who are given permanent residence at the outset um, are able to bring their family right away. And I would hope that the government is seriously considering a similar type of um, stream or class for, for caregivers. I don't know if you have anything else to add on top of that, Emmy. Our position has always been that regardless of status, a worker is a worker is a worker. So they should all be protected. Fantastic. Um, Mary Jane and Melanie, um, do you have anything else to add? I think I agree with Amy. Yeah, worker is need to protected. Not only because they are worker, they are not really protected from other, you know, rules mm -hmm. that they made. Right, Melanie. Uh, I think that's everything. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you for sharing. I want to thank Ma for um, expressing her insights and uh, her experience as an advocate for migrant workers. And again, I want to thank you both, Melanie and Mary Jane, for taking the time to share some difficult parts of your life and to um, sharing some very personal details of your life too. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jamie. Migration Conversations is created and hosted by me, Professor Jamie Liu, and produced by University of Ottawa Tech Law Fellow June Gleed. This podcast was made possible with the guidance and assistance of University of Ottawa Tech Law Fellow Ritesh Kotak, Carleton University graduate student Rachel McNally, as well as the generous support of Carleton University and the University of Ottawa shared online projects and initiatives. You can find more Migration Conversations episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube with closed captions. Thank you for listening and a special thank you for all the guests who have shared their experiences publicly.